And we are back, folks, with another edition of the Michigan Recruiting Insider. Another one. It's another one. Every episode we've done, it seems like for a couple months now, we have been talking about another commitment. This is no exception, as Channing Goodwin is officially in the fold. That's what this episode was held for. If you're wondering what the rhythm to the release is, we kind of time it up to when we know commitments are coming down. So Channing Goodwin leads off this episode before we get into it. want to remind you, if you like this podcast, be sure to rate it, be sure to review it, be sure to tell all your friends about it. That's if you're listening to us. Uh, you can tell them they can get it on Google, Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, you name it. If you're watching us on YouTube, of course, like the video, subscribe to the channel. That's how you keep the channel growing. You keep us going. And of course, the best way to follow everything we do, football, basketball, recruiting, intel, message boards, uh, the entire 24-7 sports network, and having access to all of that, Subscribe to us over on the MichiganInsider.com. One dollar gets you in your first month. Then, on top of all that, once you become a full paying member after a month, you also get access to Paramount Plus with your subscription. So, great bang for your buck, the best bang for your buck out there if you're a Michigan fan. With that, the best team in the land when it comes to Michigan football, basketball, and recruiting is the crew at TMI. Starting off first with Mr. Steve Lorenz. Steve, how are you? Good, Sam. Round two. Uh, hopefully this one goes better than our attempt, our earlier attempt. Uh, I anticipate it will, but, uh, yeah, another commitment breakdown. It feels like it is. It's becoming a, a weekly situation here for, for us and for Michigan fans. No doubt. And the, the great thing about getting a do over with this episode, cause for folks who don't know, we initially tried to do this, um, Friday and it was like, ah, didn't work. So now we're recording as I'm down in Ohio. So the background's all different. I'm in my hotel room in Columbus, Ohio, of all places, right? So uh, this gives us an opportunity to get Bryce on note. So because Bryce wasn't available yesterday, but now here he is. Bryce, how are you? I'm solid. So like I said in the Slack, it was tomorrow when I was talking about. So I was right. I got the days right. You guys just (laughs) missed it. Okay. just missed it. All right. Yeah, sometimes it works out, right? Just like uh, the Channing Goodwin recruitment. Uh, You know, it's not typical that a wide receiver, uh, you know, comes from offensive lineman stock. But that's exactly what happened here as his dad, Jonathan Goodwin, was a standout offensive lineman at the University of Michigan. His uncle, Harold, also an offensive lineman at the University of Michigan. Now the run game coordinator for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He has had Michigan in his life and in his blood, obviously, from birth, right? Uh, But Michigan did his due diligence in recruiting this young man on the merits, forging a relationship with him from the beginning. Ron Bellamy did a great job of that. Uh, And this kid, by virtue of recruiting him, it opened the door to Providence Day. And, uh, you know, uh, strangely enough, wound up getting them in with Jaden Davis. And Jaden commits, at least publicly, before Channing did. And so, but Channing, officially in the fold, We'll start off first with with you, Steve, because I know you went and looked at his uh, at his updated film, and you see why he is a top two four seven product, number two forty one in the country right now, according to twenty four seven Sports. Yep, first thing that jumped out to me, uh, he definitely got faster between his sophomore and his junior season. I think that's one thing that really stands out. Uh, excellent hands. Uh, kind of does that thing where he catches the ball and then goes down with one hand while he's like about going down to the ground, you know, that, that very, that extreme confidence in his hands uh, situation and not afraid to go up for contested footballs. Uh, you know, and that speaks to those strong hands that the guy like that's going to want to go up and make plays and, and succeed at it. So yeah, more than just a legacy commitment, right. Uh, feels like the kind of receiver Michigan needs in this class anyway. Uh, and, a, and a guy that, yeah, is to me is ascending. He's he is not ranked as highly as he originally was. Uh, I'm interested to see again. I don't know where and when uh, he'd be evaluated again, but I'm in- interested to see if he bumps back up a little bit uh, before the process is over, because to me, it almost is a little bit backwards, uh, because like I said, I think his junior film showed a lot of improvement over his sophomore stuff, particularly in the athleticism department so interested to see if that changes at all again for fans out there like it's it's okay if it doesn't uh it's still a guy michigan really really wanted and and not just because his dad 
uh, has a connection to the university. I mean, there are legacy kids that don't get recruited pretty consistently. You know, guys that aren't quite at a Michigan caliber uh, play are quite Michigan caliber players, but, but Chaney Goodwin is absolutely one of those for sure. Yeah. Bryce, that comes ringing through. Uh, Ron Bellamy was all over this kid. Uh, definitely didn't rest on, on its, on his laurels. And it's easy to do that with a legacy guy. You just expect him to jump into the fold. They didn't do that with, with uh, Blake Frazier. They didn't do it with Channing Goodwin. No. And honestly, they're three for three. This class, Jacob Odin, Blake Jake Frazier. Bowden. Yeah. And now Channing Goodwin. And the thing with Channing, you know, watching his film too, I'm really impressed with, he just seems to get open. You know, I don't think he's like a blazer. I don't think he's going to be the speedster in this class. But he finds a way to always get open. He can read coverages, you know, and see where the holes are in the defense and kind of sit there. And on top of all this, he's got a great connection with the quarterback who's going to be coming into Michigan as well. So I'm a huge fan. I know before the podcast – People always like, you know, making comparisons. Who does this guy remind you of? Sam, I said, this is just my opinion. He's a bigger, probably more physical Roy Roundtree at this point coming out of high school. And I was looking at both of them. Six foot one. We're, he's listed, I think, right now around 180. Sam, I, you might feel he's a little bigger than that. But physical, strong, can take on a couple, you know, tacklers. And on top of all this, I think that's overlooked most of all. He's got a great football IQ. I mean, coming from the family he has, and he knows the game. He knows, like I said, the quarterback. And on the other thing with all this to wrap it up, he's going to be elite recruiter for Michigan. You know, he's another guy in the fold that's going to be helping other guys trying to get to Michigan. And they have a few others at Providence Day. One in this cycle, Jordan Chip, one of his fellow wide receiver classmates as well. Yeah, they play. They just play with teams, <laughs> you know. So you you watch them play. Uh, you got a five star trigger man throwing to two D one receivers, uh, and he, it's not fair. Their, yeah, and their skill sets kind of complement. Yeah, you, know, you look at Ship, who we'll talk about a bit here shortly. I know we we have in the past. He's a catch radius guy. Every, anywhere you throw the ball in his vicinity, I mean, the dude can jump out the gym. He's a contortion contortionist uh, performer. He's that guy. This, uh, to piggyback on what you guys said, and Channing is a really, really physical. So he plays through his man, whether that's a guy who's imagine boxing a guy out for a rebound, for instance. You know, that's, you know, the the lob guy is is George Ship. This is the guy who is down in the paint talking about Channing that's muscling you going up for the rebound, coming down with it. He is that guy. So he gets off the line of scrimmage. Great. You don't want to press him because he's so strong. Uh, he's a good jump ball guy as well. And then, Steve, you mentioned his speed. I think that is what flipped the the switch for Michigan. He was a recruit, but I think it intensified, and he became uh, you know a major target when they saw that he's a legit 4-5 guy. I think they saw him. They watched him run. They saw him run uh, as they went down, and they were going around to see uh, to different schools. Uh, last year during the eval period. And so you're able to see guys and uh, as they are out in workouts and that kind of thing. And uh, seeing him run, I think, was was what did it. And from that point on, they recruited him uh, as, as vigorously as any recruit, any receiver on the board. Uh, and I think that resonated with him because it was – and I know Mom and talking to Jonathan about it, she, you know, and both. And let's give Jonathan credit on this too. They made it a point to not make Michigan, you got to go to Michigan. Like They make this be your decision. If Michigan winds up being the best spot for you, great. But we are not, you don't have to go just because your family went there. And so I think the kid took that to heart. He was really looking at a lot of regional schools. But the fact that Michigan didn't just assume that he was going to go there, I think really, really hit the mark with him. And now they have a guy who, will be physically ready to to compete for playing time as a freshman. And then to your point, Bryce, already has that chemistry with the the future quarterback, which brings us to what you said about him as a recruiter. Je we saw Jordan Ship on Twitter say, where are we going to win? He knows where he knew where Channing was going to go. But this kind of shifts the deal, shifts the focus over to Jordan Ship, Steve. 
a guy whose recruitment, as we talked about in a prior episode, has suddenly intensified with Georgia's entry into the mix. Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering, maybe you guys, are. I, I, this might end up being a Michigan-Georgia battle, right? I mean, it's hard to know who Georgia's recruiting uh, because they're recruiting so many high-level guys across the board, uh, you know, but it feels like Jordan Ship's a legitimate priority for them at receiver at this point. Um, so Michigan has Channing Goodwin, Jaden Davis in their corner. I also got to remember, though, that Chris Peel signed with Georgia last cycle. So they they have somebody uh, with, you know, that with knowledge, like a, probably a friendship there of some kind who can let him know what things are like at Georgia already and, and what kind of program they run, stuff like that. So, you know, while Michigan does have some legit ends, Georgia has a, maybe a little ace up their sleeve, too, as far as um, a guy within the program already who can who can do a little bit of recruiting himself so you know yeah that one that one has gotten more interesting but you know it, it's just hard to like it's got to be enticing to to know that your your quarterback right now and your future or your your fellow your receiver mate your your guy on the other side uh, of the field uh you know are, are both going to suit up for Michigan, uh, we know there's a comfort level there with all those guys, you know, and that, that wouldn't be the question. It's just a matter of, yeah, to me, I think it just really comes down to uh, Georgia. I, I don't know. I know he's been interested. He's, he seems to have shown a lot of interest in NC State and North Carolina, I believe. But, you know, got to think if Michigan and Georgia are pushing as hard as it feels like they have been, that those might be the end up being the, the two schools at the end of the day with the best shot. Yeah, he's been there a ton. I mean, so I was talking about Carolina and NC State. Those are definitely, uh, as far as proximity is, is concerned, and that's that was an originally maybe to me the bigger opponent was proximity. I think as he's gotten out on the visit trail, especially to Michigan, that's become less of an issue to the point where he was like, I'm not even thinking about that. But that opens the door for Georgia too. His dad's an SEC guy, played at Florida. A little upset that Florida didn't really move on him. Uh, but he'll have an appreciation for UGA, big time program, back to back national champ. Uh, they are not to be uh, discounted. They are not to be dismissed. I'm like you, Steve. Uh, you get all these guys on campus together. I just momentum is a thing. I think you said that last time. Momentum is a thing in recruiting too. I think that they picked up momentum to look at another receiver who we all have crystal balls in for. We talked about in the last episode, Amarion Stewart's momentum picked up when they put him with all these he put him with Jordan Ship, put him with Channing Goodwin, put him with with uh Jaden Davis on that visit. I think you get all those guys back up again. And man, it, there's a chance, Bryce, that it could get that ball rolling all over again. So, you know, we'll see uh very clearly uh another domino in the receiver uh in the receiver room or on the receiver board. We all think that Michigan will wind up getting Amarion uh, Stewart, the question will be number three, uh, because I, you know, it looks like they'll take three receivers in this class. Who will number three be? It might be uh, first come, first serve in that regard. All right. So let's move on over to uh, some other big news. Uh, and this was this is this was kind of manufactured news. Right. I don't know about you guys, but I kept getting all these DMs and seeing all these messages on the board talking about, hey, uh, you know, will Michigan recruit another quarterback? In 24, and I was scratching my head. I was like, what are you talking? Well, Cutter Bowley's reclassifying to 24. And, you know, what about recruit maybe? And what about recruiting him there? And there are reports out that Michigan's recruiting him in 24. And I was like, man, just didn't make sense to me that that would be the case. But I checked on it and uh, with multiple sources, including the Davises, Bryce, and quickly found out that there was nothing to it whatsoever. So, Top 247 quarterback, the 2025 class right now, Cutter Bowley. has been a long-time target from Michigan, a guy from Lexington, Kentucky, um, a guy that Kirk Campbell had recently seen. He plans on going back up to the school again. And this is a guy that Michigan really likes. You know, he's been up to campus, I want to say, about four or five times. He's got a great relationship with several guys like Boo Carter, Marion Stewart, Several guys. So he's very familiar with Michigan, the guys they recruit, and everything about the program. That being said, Michigan does have a certain five-star quarterback committing the fold. And 
you know, the thing when I so I first got the same thing, Sam, of damn flooding of what, what do you think about a two quarterback class? And I was like, wow, I'm like, this is like, are you talking about the last one with Alex Orgy and Jane Denna? I was like, what are we, what are we talking about here? And they're like, well, there's speculation, rumors of him reclassifying. And how do you think Jane would take that? First off, I, I personally feel like Jane wouldn't care. That's just my, I mean, he's not, they're not worried about Bryce Underwood for next cycle. Let's say if he were to come to Michigan. So I don't think he would care if Cutter Boy were to come here, but I don't think that's going to happen. And people who I've talked to, they didn't, they didn't get that vibe either. You know, I've, the, the basically what I was told point blank was if he does reclassify Cutter Boy to the 2024 class, Michigan will end pursuit of him point blank that's what i was told yeah steve uh that's pretty consistent you know it's one thing to have a a five-star quarterback come in the class after you but the same class you know that that gets to be a little bit different uh and that's why kurt campbell was very proactive in killing this rumor before it even picked up steam yeah let's let's talk about like the worst idea in the world uh, <laughs> we're recording every week about a new commitment Michigan's adding. Let's let's alienate the top player in our class by recruiting another player at his position in the class and uh, doing it without him knowing that they're doing it. Uh, all the while, you're gaining momentum with the number one quarterback in the 2025 class, a player – that Davis's family has specifically said they would want him to, to commit to Michigan eventually. Let's just blow all of that up and ruin all that momentum that we just got done talking about that Michigan has had uh, by doing this. Yeah, uh, really dumb. Uh, you know, Cutter Bowley, I believe he's a little bit older for his class, which I think is one of the reasons why he's looking at reclassifying. So from his standpoint, it makes total sense. Uh, and I can see Kentucky, Penn State. I think there are a few other schools that are uh, sniffing around or at least would, would actually would like him to maybe move up a class so that they could take him in the 24 cycle. But from Michigan's standpoint, yeah, I mean, um, got to be disappointing for the staff to have to reach out to, to their star commitment to say, hey, like, not sure why this is a thing, but we're not recruiting another quarterback in your class. Like, you know, because you got to think they probably told Jaden Davis throughout his recruitment, hey, you're our guy. You're the you're going to be the only guy for us. Like, you know, uh, and then to have to come back a month and a half later after he commits and tell him like, hey, by the way, where you really are the guy still. I don't know where that's coming from. Um, got to be annoying. But like you said, Sam, looks good for Kurt Campbell, though, to nip it in the bud before it really even gets going at all, um, you know, really probably endears him even more to the Davis family. You remember they liked Matt Weiss. The question was, what can Kurt Campbell do? He obviously did enough to get Davis to commit, but doing things like that uh, can really even help strengthen those bonds. So, yeah, yeah, that, yeah whatever. I'm on fire, yeah. Steve. That's, that's a great commentary, and it totally encapsulates, I think, what Kurt Campbell's, uh, his reaction probably was, because I talked to, uh, Jeremiah Davis, uh, Jaden Davis's dad, about all of this. And he said, I'll give you the quote. He said, Kirk Campbell called and said, Jeremiah, this report is out there. I just want to let you know it's not true. Yes, I've been talking to the Cutter kid, but for 25. The thing I want to make sure you understand is that Jaden is the only quarterback we're taking in this class, period. And then Jeremiah went on to say, I, I hadn't even seen the report yet. And that's the point, right? Yeah, I mean, look, yeah, you have to deal, you have to fend off negative recruiting anyway. Typically, you expect it to be other schools and not, you know, having to refute uh, false reports. But it all falls under the same umbrella, right? You got to keep guarding your yard against things that might affect uh, your recruits, your, your commits, your recruiting class. And so this is just another sign that they got a heck of a recruiter in Kirk Campbell on the job. And this is not being in a, a, afraid of competition, you, it's a great point to raise again, Steve, that th the Davises are very much on board with, they mentioned Bryce Underwood specifically, but if Cutter Bowley was 25, 
I think they would be willing to participate in that recruitment too. So this is not a dude that shies away from competition, but this, you know, this is different because it's a great point. Another great point you made, Steve, even if he is the most competitive guy in the world and has no issue with another quarterback coming in the class with them, the fact that this would be an instance of Michigan trying to snake him, trying to do something undercover, do something behind the scenes that was different from what they told them, that that's a tr- then it becomes a trust thing. Yep. Right. And so going back on your word. Yeah. yeah. You're going back on your word. You're sneaking around. Why would we trust you to come there if you're if you do that? Even if we are a big time competitor. So you see why why Kirk Campbell was so proactive with this. Like, man, I can't have these dudes think these guys thinking I'm being dishonest with them. And so great job on his part. Obviously you wish you didn't have to do it, but that's recruiting these days, right? You got to fend off enemies in all directions. Uh, And this was just another one of those instances, but Bryce Underwood guys, you know, we had the interview with his dad and he talked about how, look, we don't want to be in a situation where Bryce is following a five-star quarterback in the year in a class before him, you know, that, that is something that we are paying very, very close attention to. So against that backdrop, when Jaden committed, I was like, man, this is going to harm their chances. Uh, you keep recruiting them to keep fostering a relationship because you don't know if his opinion on that might change in a year, or maybe he goes someplace else and you want to hit him in the portal, all kinds of reasons to stay engaged, Steve. But that future play, that thought process towards, hey, let's work for the future, uh, that might have been a premature pivot on my part because it seems like the relationship piece, relationship building piece that Kirk Campbell is doing with Bryce Underwood is working right now as he just made his way back to campus, uh, what was it, a couple weeks ago, and he, uh, uh, Campbell is supposed to be out seeing Bryce at his school uh, or dropping by his school, I should say, next week and then Bryce is expected to be at Michigan several times over the course of the remainder of the spring and summer this recruitment despite the commitment of Jaden Davis continues to trend up for Michigan and and it's I, I I just don't think you can speak enough about the Davises not just being okay with it but like actively saying like we'd love to have Bryce Underwood commit in the 2025 class. I, I I think it's interesting. I, I don't know how he and his camp are dictating uh, what constitutes an elite quarterback in front of them. And the, I mean, is, is this a commitment that would literally be decided by where a, where a kid is ranked by our analysts? You know, uh, Ohio State has a quarterback committed in 24 who's a similar ranking as Jaden Davis and Aaron Noland. Uh, I believe USC has a five-star quarterback committed or no not yet they have in the five star in 23 but they're i believe elijah brown the top 100 is a guy that uh modern day is trending towards usc uh lsu has a four-star quarterback committed in their class he's not ranked as highly as the others you know it's just i, I it's kind of an interesting you know is lsu telling their 24 quarterback that he's he's okay but he's not that good but we're gonna take you anyway you know like you know what i mean it's just kind of an interesting dynamic uh props to him to the underwood camp for being honest and open about approaching it that way i just kind of wonder what that actually constitutes you know it's, um, no, it's a great point steve i i think I, I think it's one of those you mean you have an impression about how things will go and then you get into it and you realize maybe that's not the most realistic thing i'm not saying that's where they are sure but i could see i could see that's where they might wind up Right. And that's, you know, like I said, uh, you know, are they going to watch film of these guys? Like, it's just, it, it's an interesting wrinkle in there. But like I said, to, to be open about it is more than most camps and people are willing to be about it. So it, it does. I think it makes for a kind of an interesting situation. And again, I, I go back to, I think that's why it's so important that Michigan has a quarterback committed in 24 who, who he, both he and his family uh, would welcome the competition, you know, and, and, Again, even going back to the cutter bully thing, it's another reason why Michigan does not need to do any weird movement uh, in 24 or 25. I think when you have Jaden Davis in the boat already, actively recruiting for you, 
and things are starting to turn around with Bryce Underwood. I think now is you go all out for Bryce Underwood. I think that that has to be Michigan's main play. You still recruit the other guys. You recruit Cutter Bowley if he's a 25. You recruit George McIntyre. Uh, you recruit Bryce. You mentioned Akili Smith Jr., right, as another guy it seems like they like in 25. But but I, th- I think at this point it's got to be – Underwood's got to be far and away the guy, you know. And, and another point to in, in Kurt Campbell's favor there, to, to turn that – to make a 180 – out of that situation, not just to make a one eight, but to do it so quickly, uh, incredibly impressive. So, uh, yeah, that's what I'd be doing if I was Michigan. I, I just think it'll be interesting, you know, because and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe it was like LSU, Ohio State, USC were sort of the three other programs I think have been mentioned most with Bryce Underwood. But um, you know, maybe if there's another elite program that steps up and, and doesn't ha- either doesn't sign a quarterback or you know gets a lower end guy from the rankings, you know, maybe that puts them up there as well yeah you know it bryce i I can't help but have the the contrast with dante Moore. you know can you use proximity to your advantage i just felt like man you didn't have him up nearly as often as as you would think with him only being in detroit right i mean that's just you had a different recruiter at the helm at that time uh they would be in a worse position with bryce underwood right now if there were not a change, we know that <laughs> it's, it's that is said as much, right? They would be in worse position with Bryce Underwood right now if there hadn't been a change uh, at the QB coach. But now with Kirk in there, uh, and props, to, I got to shout out Steve Klinkscale again for even keeping it alive because the recruit, you he had to he had to pride and and I won't say beg, but, but just be all over him just to come on campus. That's how done. They were with with Michigan. He got on really, really connected with Kirk. And now, Bryce, I mean, it's not just being on campus for three times in the last couple of months. Over the summer, spring and summer, there's talk that he could be up here, you know, every other week. I mean, he's he's only – so it's not like this huge undertaking. He's literally like 20 minutes away. Like, he's not that far. But still, the fact that he would actually do it, there's talk that that's what's going to be the case, that he's going to be a regular – on Michigan's campus, that you know that has a way of wearing down some of those kind of preconceived notions about what your criteria is. He may have been thinking, and they may have been thinking full bore. You know what? They get a five star. We aren't looking. But you, the more you build that relationship, the more comfortable you feel on campus. The less you know prevalent that that factor of a quarterback being ahead of you uh, might be. Yeah, and I, you know, you're talking about, well, you know, it's right around the corner. Well, they could have been doing this, you know, freshman, sophomore year. Like, you hadn't, you didn't need to wait, but all of a sudden it's changed, you know? So, I obviously, you got to give props to Kurt Campbell. He's done a great job with that relationship with him and his circle. Um, But I I think the thing that's really interesting with this, these visits, is we've said, you know, he could, he could have been making visits earlier to Michigan. And he chose not to. And he doesn't seem or his family like the type of people that are just going to visit a school just to visit schools. Like they're going to go, you know, across the. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just <laughs> saw a flying cat just go. <laughs> That's going to Mom's on vacation. So I got to leave the door open when we're recording right now. Otherwise, they go crazy. So she's, saw, she's like, been, a, she's been yeah, all over the place. Yeah, yeah, I, just I, just I just saw a rainbow cat. I just saw a rainbow cat just go fly across. This cat boop. made an appearance on the last one. Boop. Yeah, boop, boop. That's her second straight appearance. I don't think we'll see Nugget. I don't think she'll come up here, but yeah, boop, boop all over the place. Never ending. So <laughs> Yeah, if you're listening to the podcast, you just uh, pull it up. Pull up about the just 28 pull it up. minute mark. And you'll see it. But anyway. Yeah, um, I I just feel like again, this is a type of kid that Steve even said to you gotta go all out for. I think he's got first round potential right now. I think I'm a huge fan of him. I mean, shoot, Sam. Years ago, we saw him at a camp as an eighth grader. As an eighth grader. And I forgot who pointed out to us, and they said, this kid from Belleville oh, will be Crowell. the next star. Yes. It was, okay, Crowell. It was Crowell. And he said, and he said, this is going to be one of the top players in America as an eighth grader. He already knew, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so they have a lot of talent at Belleville. Don't get me wrong. But for him to say that and make that just statement as an eighth grader, you this know, it's dude. incredible. Just like Dante, so he steps in as a freshman and leads these guys, but then he leads them to -to back-to-back titles. Crazy. 
and is their favorite to win a third one. I mean, you and they should. And, and, and look, I think Dante is very, very talented. I think you guys know that. I think he's a very talented guy. This dude is even better physical talent. So, uh, yeah, man, you keep recruiting this dude. E- e- even if you thought there was no chance of getting him, yep. you keep recruiting this guy, yep. right? But it just so happens that there's a chance. I'm telling you, there's a chance. They're, they're, so. starting, to, they're starting to turn the corner here. This, new this, coach. This, new coach yeah. there now, too. I mean, yeah, you want to keep recruiting the star player with a new coach, without a new coach, whatever. But either way, you know, yeah, Michigan – uh, looking for Jeremiah Beasley at Belleville too, you know. So yeah, I mean this this is a it's another opportunity for Michigan to kind of right the ship. I think the craziest thing about the back to back titles for them is that as a true he's the one that put them over the hump. I mean Belleville was how close so many times and and couldn't quite finish the job, and then a uh, true freshman comes in at quarterback and ends up being the guy to lead them there. So you know, yeah, it might three peat. They're gonna yeah, like Bryce said, heavily favored to three-peat this year, so. Yeah, man, and last year, you know, a different kind of adversity, Crowell gets suspended late in the season, and you got to you gotta figure it out. You got to keep leading the team, and, and they were able to keep going, and that's because really, really talented team. You have a, other talented coaches on that staff, but, dude, you got a trigger man like this, like Bryce, yeah, that, that fixes a whole lot, and it wound up fixing missing your head coach at that point uh, in the season last year. So big, big, big deal. We need to get to a break. But before we do, I want to talk a little bit about edge recruiting because, Steve, you just put in a crystal ball. We always highlight when we put in crystal balls. And so you just put in one. Why don't you tell the folks who it was for? So crystal ball in for uh, Pittsburgh three-star Cole Sullivan, uh, you know, athlete, but is a guy who could – project to edge. There was a user on our board. I can't remember which user uh, mentioned Chase Winovich as a potential comparison for him. I actually had checked in on that and was given a very affirmative response uh, as far as I I believe that's what Michigan kind of views Cole Sullivan as as well. Uh, You know, and and so, yeah, I think we've talked about edge a little bit. I think the question they take Cole Sullivan, uh, Again, maybe an edge could be a tight end, could be a linebacker. There's a few different spots uh, that I think Michigan is at least keeping an eye on him. Uh, will not impact any of the other major edge targets that we've talked about. Guys like Dominic Nichols, who we think Michigan is in a pretty good spot for right now. Darian Mayo, who to me I think is the best, at least the highest ceiling edge guy that they're recruiting, uh, and another guy that Steve Wiltfong just mentioned on his uh, whip around on 24-7 sports as uh, that Michigan might be in the lead there. Uh, so, you know, a lot of things are happening at edge. That both Nichols and Mayo are expected to official in June, so, uh, you know, we'll see if they want to end their recruitments anywhere around that time frame. But, yeah, Cole Sullivan uh, could be a guy to decide sometime in the near future. might be the next – could be another episode at some point that we're uh, recapping his commitment. So, right. you know, another one there. And then, yeah, then there's still the other guys like like a, like a Brian Robinson type who, uh, you know, has been to Michigan more times than I have uh, in the last <laughs> however long. So, you know, and that, that so that one's still another one. I know you guys are going to see him tomorrow uh, at the Under Armour, the huge Under Armour event. Uh, but, yeah, like a, a Cole Sullivan, if he, if he does commit to Michigan, uh, which we believe he will, would be treated 100% as an athlete, would not really impact their pursuits at any of the positions that that he might project to. Yeah, yeah, it was um, – you're on fire today, by the way, Steve. <laughs> on fire today. Uh, Marquise Lightfoot, another one that they have uh, made it a point to reiterate how much of a priority he is. Uh, you have, I think, an asset – and Marion Stewart in that in that school over at Kenwood Academy now. I think it's my opinion. I think he's a heavy Michigan lean. Uh, I think Michigan will get Marion Stewart. That's why I have a crystal ball. We all have crystal balls in for him. Uh, yeah, I think he's their top receiver on the board, and I think he's going to be a an ardent recruiter. Uh, it helps having a guy like that in the school over at Kenwood Academy to help with with him. And I like the the Chase Winovich comparison, Chase. 
was just an athlete. He started out as a linebacker, remember, moved over to tight end and then came back over to edge. This is really you got an athlete like that, a dude with that kind of length who can really, really run. He pro- can project in a lot of different places. And I think that's valuable to bring in a guy like that in this mix. Because you you can you can kind of move pieces around the your recruiting board a little bit when you have a versatile piece like a Sullivan, assuming they're able to close that one out. So, uh, you know, I know you liked this film too when you saw it, Bryce. Oh, yeah. Six foot three, 200 plus pounds, heat seeking missile, had over 100 tackles this past season. So he's an incredible athlete. And just even before this podcast, we were talking, I was, and I think Steve or someone said, but like, he's a hardball guy. You watch his film and you're like, we can see Jim Harbaugh ran all over why he would love a guy as much as he does. And like you said, the position versatility he brings to this class is essential because let's say he doesn't work out at linebacker. Try him at tight end. Let's say that doesn't work out. Try fullback. Try edge. Try. And, you know, eventually here's the thing. Michigan's pretty good at finding a guy, his position. Once he gets to Ann Arbor, ask Chase, ask so many of these other guys that Jim Harbaugh has moved around in the past. You know, Mike Sands, uh, Ristol, and uh, like, I mean, R- Mikey. So it's like so many of these guys, I'm not worried about if he, you know, if they do decide to move a guy because usually they, one, they have the coaching, two, they can develop them, and three, they've had a great eye for their evaluations and scouting. That's been very apparent we've seen throughout Jim Harbaugh's, you know, era here in Ann Arbor. Yeah, so two things to close out this segment and get to a break. This furthers one of the major factors that we talked about how Michigan has sort of flipped its recruiting fortunes, not to rehash everything that we said, but footprint recruiting. So they had already turned up the heat in Illinois. They've been doing it for years. Ohio is coming back online. We'll pick up on that theme uh, in the second half of the Recruiting Insider. But Pennsylvania recruiting. You know, that is becoming more of a thing now. And Pennsylvania used to be such a huge part of Chad Henney, Marlon Jackson, Steve Breston, Ryan Mundy. Uh, You go to uh, Tim Massacoy. I mean, there were so many guys. You can even go back to Ty Law. I mean, you you had guys coming from PA all the time, and then it just disappeared. I mean, Chase from PA. But it's like, you know, those guys were few and far between. Kalik Hudson. But it was like spot duty. Now, they are turning up the heat in the state of Pennsylvania right now, which gets back to what we were talking about with with footprint recruiting. But getting back over to Ohio and getting back over to Edge, yeah, Brian Robinson, have crystal balls in for B-Rob. But as the Edge recruiting intensifies and as guys come into the fold, there's that, that circumstantial pressure. I mean, the coaches don't have to say, hey, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? The class will say it. So it kind of put, you know, that's the kind of thing where if you're Brian Robinson and you're leaning to Michigan and Michigan is where you want to go, you got to be looking at how the class is unfolding if that's really what you want to do. Because there is a scenario that if, you know, if if guy if Darian Mayo and, and you know, let, let's say things pick up with Dylan Stewart or let's say something picks up with, with, with Lightfoot or, I mean, there's a scenario, man, where, you know, all the, you know, all the seats at the end are full. All the rooms at the end are full. So uh, that will be interesting to really talk to to B Rob, talk to Brian about, and we will have an update on that on the MichiganInsider.com during the week. We will also have an update on the number one player in the state of Ohio. I made it down to Springfield High School on Friday. Uh, sat down with Mo Douglas, who I've known for 20 years. Mo Douglas, who uh, is a former uh, former coach at Tribewood Madison, sent five guys to Michigan. So it's Rion Dawson, Brandon Moore, Mike Shaw, Roy Roundtree. Um, there's one more. And hey, Mike McCray, right? So sent five guys from his program to Michigan, right? Used to work Michigan's camp all these years. So he's always had an open door to Michigan. And now his teammate of eight seasons is the head coach at Michigan and a guy who he's known known since he was coaching at Ashland and Steve Klinkscale is there as well. These help open the doors for the number one player in the state of Ohio, Aaron Scott. And this is 
the fiercest battle for the number one pl player in Ohio, at least between Michigan and Ohio State, since Zach Harrison, right? And so I sat down with Mo Douglas to talk about it. I obviously sat down with Aaron Scott as well. When we come back on the other side, we will come back with the interview with Mo Douglas. So stay tuned for that, and then we'll react on the other side here on the Michigan Recruiting Insider. All right, sitting here with... Man, I feel like we going back to the old days with uh, my man Mo Douglas. Mo, how you doing? Great, doing great, Sam. Great to be talking to you, brother. Yeah, it's good to be talking to you too, Mo. Uh, I've seen you put a lot of guys in in college situations and into their professional life. You've been doing it for a long time. What what makes you keep doing it, Mo? Man, these babies, man. They need the opportunity, man. And uh, it's something that God had just placed in my heart, man. And uh, Got a love for the kids and want to see them excel and get to whatever height they want to try to get to. I got you. So let's talk about Aaron Scott. Number one corner in the country, maybe. Certainly the number one prospect in Ohio. You coach him. Break him down. What makes him special? Uh, his attention to details. Uh, he's got great work habits. He's um, one of our top kids as far as whatever we ask him to do or whatever we tell him he needs to be doing, he knew he does that. Um, we tell him that you need to work on your, your off man. Uh, we tell him you need to go work on your character. He does whatever we have planned for him or what we seek for him to do. And uh, he's just a great kid overall, man. So break down his, his skill set. What does he do well on the field? On the field, his, uh, his, his press man is good. Got good feet, good hands, good hand placement. Uh, he's got great eyes. Trying to keep him from looking in that backfield because when you get a little, when you got some, when you got some talent, uh, you get a little nosy every now and then. But uh, keep training his eyes. Uh, uh, he's just got. He does a great job of making sure he watches his opponent. Does a great job of film study. Um, he pays attention to t details as far as route combinations, locations on landmarks on the field. Uh, hand placement every week. He asks for the number one guy on the other team, and we give it to him. And for the most part, he's lived up to the bill each week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so uh, when you, I know coaches, a lot of coaches don't like to do comparisons, but folks who haven't seen Aaron play, is there a player in college or pros that, you know, he might remind them of? Um, he would probably, I would say, a younger Jalen Ramsey. When uh, Jalen was coming out, uh, long guy. Great limb, good in and out of his breaks, um, good ball placement skills where he, he puts his hands in the right spots to knock break, break up passes and things like that. But just just a good athlete. I mean, he was a quarterback when he, when he first came into high school. And after that season, he and I had a talk, and I was like, son, I know you want to play quarterback, but there ain't that many Lamar Jacksons out there. <laughs> Your your throwing days, your throwing mechanics aren't that great, but you I mean I said, but you can get paid if you come over here and play defense. And uh, he thought about it, and then when he came about a week later, he came up to me and said, "I'm gonna try it, coach." And two years, almost three years coming up, hey, look where he's at now. Look where he's at now, number one in the country. So he listened to you on that. So I imagine he's gonna listen to your counsel when he's going to the through the recruiting process, or he is listening to your counsel. What are you stressing to him? What are you telling him to look for as he evaluates the schools? Do your research. Um, look and see what, depending on what school it is, what degree you would like to go into, what field you would like to do after the game is over. Because if, even if you're blessed enough to go and play in the NFL 10, 12 years, you're still going to have another 40 to 50 years to live, good Lord willing. But um, just do your research. Don't go to a school because of the coaches, because that can change any day of the week. Go because of the, the opportunity that you're gonna have in the school that you're selecting. Mm -hmm. um, locations, sometimes location is good. Sometimes you wanna be far away, sometimes you wanna be closer away. Family distance, things were just, just things outside of the, the football aspect of it. It's, it's bigger than that, you know, because if you can't see yourself, say something was to happen to you on campus or you got hurt and playing the game, you couldn't play no more. Could you see your stuff still going there, getting their education? And so just things like that. But um, he's pretty well-rounded, so he's doing his research and uh, checking off the boxes on what they play defensively, what do they do 
uh, what players have they put in whatever positions that there are to be successful. And uh, the coaches, like I said, the coaches going to change. It can change each and every week. Uh, but that has a small part to play in it, but not a large part as we think. Yeah, man. You know, you definitely practice what you preach when you say um, you're telling guys go wherever the best fit for you. It's not always like that. I, Ohio isn't the only place where if you're in a state, you send guys to the state school. You send guys everywhere. And you've always sent guys everywhere. Where does that come from, Mo? Because there's a lot of pressure that tells you, you know, hey, man, guard your yard. You know, protect yeah. the borders. Don't yeah. let anyone in. Yeah. Why have you never done that? Because it's not about me. It's about the kids and what's best for them. You know, I would love for them. I mean, if they could... I know people would love for them just to stay in Ohio and, and then that would be it, but it's a bigger world out there than this. And uh, in the real world, you gotta, you're gotta going to meet people from all over the place. And the thing is, my thing for that kid is to just put them in the best position to be successful. I don't care where it is. If that's going to school in Columbus, or if it's going to school in Ann Arbor, or if it's going to school in Stanford, or, you know, whatever. Um, just for them to, whatever they can be the most successful at. Um, I know people want to keep people around. But my thing is to make sure they get an opportunity at some level and whatever's best for them. Well, here's what we know, though, for a good 10, 15 years, Mo. Number one player in the state of Ohio wasn't even looking Michigan's way. Like, it just yeah. was, no, was no contest. Yeah. Right? Now, it's a little bit different. Right? Yeah. Now, now they're starting to look again. And I these are some guys that you know up there. So let's start off with... With Jim Harbaugh, and you, what you know about Jim, your connection with him, Jim, what can you say about Jim Harbaugh? Man, yeah, our connection goes back to us playing together with the Bears. I think we played together for eight years, both of our first eight years. And uh, he's a good dude, man. He's he made or helped develop some, some programs to take him to different heights. San Diego University. When before he was there, they were nobody knew him. Next thing you know, they got a quarterback that's in the NFL that's been playing now for twenty dang, years. Dang, that feels like that long. <laughs> right. Then he goes to Stanford, takes that program, and at the time he got it, they were getting beat by everybody. But then when he leaves, by the time he leaves, heck, they're they're battling for the, the Heisman Trophy winner, you know, or the Heisman Trophy kid, or a guy that's winning playing in the Rose Bowl. Then he goes to the 49ers goes to the Super Bowl. He takes that team to the Super Bowl. He comes home to Michigan. The roster wasn't as good as it is, and it needed to be at the time, but now he's got it to where it's at an elite level with, that can battle in Ohio State or Georgia or Florida or Alabama. Now you, he's recruiting on an elite level. And so now it makes it a whole lot easier for you to make them calls you got the running backs in the backfield, or you got the receivers or quarterbacks. So I'm just happy for Jim to be able to be in that position. Yeah, it's also easier to go in Ohio when you got an Ohio guy doing it. Yeah. And so you go and get Clink. You go get Clink. And now Clink is coming back around. So what can you say about Steve Clink's scale? Man, man, Clink, I've been knowing Clink for like the last 21 years. I think my first job at Trotwood, he was at Ashland University. And uh, so we go way back. Uh, good. Good man, got a good character, man. Uh, somebody, if you had a son, you would want him to, to learn under him. But, you know, the game changes every week, you mm -hmm. know, so people may be here a minute or they'd be gone. But uh, he's been a loyal dude from the times I've known him, man, like I said, for like the last 20 years. All the pit stops he's been at, he's done a great job with those kids, and I know he'll continue to do a great job where he's at now. Yeah, and, and to keep it balanced, man, let's talk a little bit about the old, old state dudes, too. Let's give it to so, the old. <laughs> Let's talk about Coach Walton. What about Coach Walton? Coach Walton is a good dude, man. Um, I haven't known him as long as I have Coach Clink, but over the past two years now, I've gotten a chance to really get a chance to know him. I knew him when he was playing, with, when he was coaching in the NFL, but not um, to the extent that we know now. Um, Coach Walton is a good dude, man, and he's got – he got BIA. He said he got them boys. They coming back. You know. He said he gonna have his guys all healthy this year, and they gonna see a different, <laughs> different Buckeye back in. But uh, he's a good dude, man, and uh, a great uh, mentor to a bunch of those guys up there. I've seen some of the good work he's doing with the BBs in that in his room, and uh, the kids love him. Yeah, and then Coach Day. 
Coach Day. Coach Day, I like I rocks with Coach Day. I, at first, I wasn't, I haven't been a, I, I liked Ohio State, don't get me wrong. I liked Ohio State, but I think that game against Georgia, it took my, my respect and my uh, openness towards Coach Day to another level because I saw the passion that he played, that he coached with that day, and I saw the effort that his players played with. And it took, it took me, put me in another level. Now I'm right there with you, Coach Day. I told you when you came up in here that I rocks with you now. And, uh, and he's done what he said he was going to do. He said he's going to take care of the house, and he's taking care of Ohio. All right, so let's look ahead to the season, Mo. I mean, look, you, it seems like every year you got a bullseye on your back, man, wherever, wherever you are. So, so give me an outlook for this, this season. And then what does the year look like for, for Aaron? Because it sounds like he wants to get his recruitment out of the way before the season starts. Well, let's start with Aaron. Well, we got Aaron, um, he's going to try to get it over with um, by July. He's going to do his officials in June and, or the end of this month of June and try to make his decision sometime in July, which will make it that easy for him to focus on just playing football um, because he's going to be expected to be a big part of that, the back end and our whole team as a whole. But we have a good group coming back. Um, we returned four to offensive, five offensive linemen. We got two to three defensive linemen coming back, but we got a good group. Probably, I want to say we probably have seven, eight starters returning on each side. Quarterback's going to be a younger guy, but he's been with us for two years. But it's wide open. We're gonna have quarterback. We got competition everywhere. Quarterback competition gonna be there too. But whoever that guy is that leads this team, he's gonna have some pieces to play with, and our coaching staff will get him in the right position to be able to be successful. Um, defensively, we got we got a good back end. All right, Mo. Last one for you. You you told me what you were stressing to Aaron to look for. But this is a different question. When he gets ready to make his decision, what do you think is going to come down to? What do you think, when he is comparing and contrasting, is going to make the decision be one school versus all the rest? You know what, man? Um, I think it's, it's, I don't really, it's going to be what, what, what they do defensively for a large part, I think, because he wants to play a certain brand of ball. He's mm -hmm. trying to play on Sundays. Lord willing, he'll stay healthy for the next three to four years, get his shot. And whatever guy can mentor him in that area and get him to get to that, the best of he can, ability that he can be at the next elite level for him to make it there, that's going to be the choice that he's going to probably end up making. But all those guys who are recruiting him have got guys in the NFL. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think it's just going to be uh, the comfortability of his family uh, and what they believe and what they think about that particular staff or school that's going to sway him in that direction. But whatever choice he makes, man, I'm rooting for him regardless. You know, like I tell him, wherever you go, you like it, I love it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to be with you either way. If it's in Columbus, if it's in Tennessee, if it's in California, don't matter. You know, I'm rocking with you either way. Got you. Mo Doug, man, it's like old times. We back at it, Sam. I am. <laughs> All right, appreciate you, man. Thanks a appreciate lot. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, so fellas, you just heard him talk about how much respect, how high regard he has for Jim Harbaugh. He's man, my teammate for eight seasons. We came in together and together all those years. And then he goes over his resume from San Diego to, to he said he turned San Diego around. He turned Stanford around. Then he goes to the 49ers and he wins the Super Bowl. Now he turns Michigan. He knows the resume, right? So why is that important? And he knows Clink, right? Why is that important? Because when you are recruiting in enemy territory, and you guys know this cover recruiting for a long time, a lot of times the environment around them, whether it's people in the school, coaches, people in the community, there's negative recruiting that you got to chop through. They are telling kids everything under the moon to downplay, in this case, Michigan. And you got to cut through that. Well, Having Mo there doesn't push him to Michigan. He's not pushing the kid to Michigan. But what it does do, Steve, is it kind of filters out some of that negative talk that you might otherwise have to overcome. You got a guy in the school that'll make say, you know what, Ohio State's a great school kid, but Michigan's a great school too. That's what it balances the equation a little bit for them. <clears throat> I got to think that that scenario of like coaches, classmates, community, 
it's got to be worse in Ohio for Michigan than maybe any program has to deal with in any state, right? I mean, it's got to be way up at the top of the list. I mean, I I, I feel like I don't know if it was Nolan Rumler, uh, somebody like there was a somebody from Ohio that committed to Michigan, and I remember that they said that they would have committed to Michigan earlier in the process if if they knew they would have avoided the harassment, like just the the basically harassment that they would have gotten for committing to Michigan earlier. So. I, yeah, I got to think eliminating that part of it, or at least like, you know, down or, you know, lessening it uh, is going to just help Michigan naturally. But, I, you know, Aaron Scott could really be a five star prospect, honestly. Um, he's he, he's rightfully ranked as the top prospect in Ohio. Um, and, and really, it's been fascinating. I, I don't know if we had discussed this or not, but but, you know, Michigan recruiting both. Aaron Scott and Bryce West. Bryce West, another four-star corner out of Glenville in Cleveland. Um, earlier in the process, it kind of felt like Michigan was in looked good or looked like they were really in decent shape with Bryce West, uh, and maybe not so much with Aaron Scott. Or we at least we didn't hear as much about Aaron Scott. That has done a that's been a complete 180 since then. I feel like I mean it does feel like Michigan has a much much better chance of landing Aaron Scott. Than they do Bryce West, and uh, you know, I think Michigan would be getting the better prospect of the two uh, on the on the surface if that was to happen. So, uh, but yeah, Zach Harrison. I was even trying to think of what the last time before that probably would have been around when Hope got hired, right? The last time Michigan was battling Ohio State for the top player in Ohio was was Kalis the number one. Player? That's what I, Kyle Kalis is who I thought of. I, I'm pretty sure that he was one or two in Ohio for for sure. You know, and that was what the thirteen or the the two thousand twelve class, I believe. So I mean, either yeah, not something that's happened very often in the last fifteen years or so. When you consider how big rivals the two programs are, you know, and so uh, Ohio State got Zach Harrison. This one is it feels similar in that it's a close race, uh, but the difference is Michigan's got two wins in their back pocket. Right. Steve Klinkscale is one of the best developers of defensive backs in the country and has a, a long laundry, a laundry list of players to back it up. And, uh, you know, just the, the landscape is a little bit different right now in Michigan's favor than it, than it would have been uh, in the Zach Harrison recruitment. I'll never forget hearing from one of the, one of the guys behind the scenes about Zach Harrison. Said, Man, I can't go to Michigan and lose. Stop. He went to Michigan or he went to Ohio state and lost to Michigan, but still he was like, I can't go there. And lose. Well, Aaron didn't have to worry about that if he were to pick Michigan. Michigan's already a beat him, and uh, he was on hand for the beatdown in Columbus, uh, and that had an impact. I mean, you'll you'll see. So we'll have an impact uh, interview up with Aaron this week. I sat down with him for a lengthy chat, lengthy, lengthy chat, uh, and then talked to him for even longer after that. But uh, he he said on the record, he said, "Yeah, that that made a that left a, a mark." Now. Don't get ahead of yourself. I, Ohio State is right there. Um, they are tugging at his heartstrings. I think Ohio State had been leading up to Michigan having him on campus for that spring practice visit. So this is, I, I think this is going to be a tug of war. This is going to be a tussle here down the stretch. And he's going to make his decision after his officials. He wants to get it done in July. You know, he said something interesting to me. He said, man, I wish it was the first game of the season, Michigan, Ohio State. Because if it, if it was the first game of the season, I'd wait. I'd wait to watch it, right? And what that says to me, it, it really highlights how much he questions their defensive scheme at Ohio State, right? Because, you know, I went into this in a, in a piece of you. You didn't see my breakdown, sort of handicapping the leaderboard. Check it out over on the MichiganInsider.com. But, you know, the, the chance to really see, are they better? Right? He'd be doing it on blind faith in July. This is why I also say don't discount Ohio State. He, you know, they're telling them we're better. They're telling them we're going to be all right in the secondary. He's got to kind of take their word for it right now. So when he said, you know, I wish, I wish it were the first game of the season, that would allow him to see. If they really have made those improvements, Michigan has to fill that void 
fill that void of uncertainty about Ohio State and and hammer it. Uh, you talk about recruiting strategy. They got to make that uncertainty be pronounced uh, because they have an advantage there. The question is, uh, Bryce, will they be able to exploit it enough to bring this one home? He gives me Will Johnson vibes as a player. Same length and physicality and ball skills. This dude was a quarterback. that he So his IQ, you see that over on defense as well. A lot to like about Aaron Scott. Yeah, and I this is a recruitment that Michigan's been working on for a long time. You know, they got him up to campus back in the winter, and then they followed up, you know, for the spring. But I think what was crucial about that is the weekend he came up, Sam. If you recall, that was the same weekend that Jordan Marshall, Jane Davis, Brady Prescorn, Blake Frazier, what happened with all those guys, Sam? My, my my memory's a little foggy. I don't I don't I don't know if they took a picture. I don't know what happened, but something happened that weekend that I guess now is resonating with uh, recruiting fans. But that being said, if Michigan were I guess to use and show them why Michigan would be the pick, I would say look, just look at recency, but look at Dax Hill, right? Look at DJ Turner. They are sending guys to the league compared to some of his other shooters, maybe in Ohio State. Uh, I haven't seen too many draft picks from their secondary recently. And on top of that, Michigan can show, like you said, Sam, Will Johnson, a guy who was a freshman, developed from game one to the Purdue game, where he's a star. Now he's looked at as a future All-American. I mean, this is substantial stuff and evidence you can show to support your claim of why you should pick Michigan. I think in that, and that's why he's considering that. And I think that's why I made that comment to you, Sam, of, man, I really want to watch that game to see what it's going to look like, because it's so much you can hear and so much you can say. Well, and I was, talk. When, I said, when I said Bryce said he, I was talking about Bryce. Uh, did I say, did I say you wanted to see the game first? I can't remember. I, I, I meant Aaron. Right, right. No, no, no. And I that's what I'm saying. Okay. Because I think that's interesting that he made that comment because I think, you know, Ohio State probably is saying, you know, we have definitely improved, you know, all this stuff. But you don't know. That's just talk. You know what I mean? Whereas Michigan can show DJ Turner get drafted, Dax Hill get drafted, Will Johnson, five-star, but he's living up to the hype. Right. (laughs) So right. they're, they're having stuff to where substantial evidence they can show him. And, you know, unfortunately, of course, he's in Ohio. And obviously how Ohio is, and Steve said, it's the toughest state for Michigan, obviously, to recruit in. But they are making inroads. They're making hay. And the coach, that I think that's a big factor, too, that he's leaving the door wide open for any school. This, this is not just a Michigan thing. This is... Eastern, this is Akron, any school that comes in. He's not going to let anyone be garage another school. You know, he's going to have all his kids have open mind and open vision and look at every suitor. So they have a great shot, though. I really think they have a great shot. I, I don't, I wouldn't say they lead, but it, I think it's between Michigan, Ohio State, and Oregon, if yeah, I were I'd to say, call it today. Yeah, I'd say they lead. That's my opinion. Um, now, can they hold on to it is the question because – Look, High State's tugging at the heartstrings. He know he'd be a hero. I mean, you turn you turned down Michigan when Michigan was good. See, it's easy for these other dudes to turn Michigan down. I mean, you're gonna go there and get blown out by Ohio State, but now Ohio State's getting blown out. So you're you're literally a hero for turning turning them down, staying home as the number one player in the state. He has Buckeyes in his family. He talked about how huge a fan of the Buckeyes his dad is like he got the Buckeye offer dad was like let's go <laughs> let's go let's let's jump on the board and, and he didn't do it so what it tells you is that he at least in part is thinking about this as a business decision can you make that be his biggest focus to me is the question for Michigan down the stretch so mm-hmm. again if you didn't read the entire breakdown Instead of handicapping the race, it lays it all out. Of course, be on the lookout. We're going to have, you know, the entire interview uh, laid out. And I talked to him about us. I talked to him about Ohio State a ton. So it wasn't I didn't come at him asking him a million questions just about Michigan. 
we dug into the Buckeyes. We talked about Oregon a lot as well. So you get a view of what he thinks about these other schools. And, you know, it's you also get the view that this is going to be a battle. You know, where it stands now does not necessarily portend where it's going to where it's going to finish. This one could jostle back and forth 20 times before he comes up with a decision. We'll be right there to cover with you every step of the way. Now, Steve, uh, to your one of the points you made, interesting the how how this seems to be the the inverse of what happened or what's happening with Bryce West because they were seemingly trending up with Bryce West and then they had both of those guys on campus very clear and you heard Mo talk about Ryan Day he said he's hey I'm gonna prioritize the state right now because Michigan has him on the they got him backpedaling a little bit and so he is putting forth more energy more effort more intensity with the guys in state. And it feels like, at least to me, that that's resonating with all the guys, but it's resonating with, with Bryce West a lot. At least that's what they say, because I, I agree. I think Ohio State's out front for Bryce West at this point. Glenville, right? I mean, that's – has Michigan ever got like, – you know, they, they signed Willie Henry. They got Frank Clark. I don't know if Ohio State really pursued yeah. those guys very heavily, right? I, so Michigan has I, maybe has always struck out with guys – that Ohio State wants out of Glenville, right? And we know they want Bryce West. It feels like they want the other uh, Demarion Witten to the tight end. Yeah, you know what? I think the last guy, and I have to ask him this, I think the last guy from Glenville that they got that Ohio State wanted was Pierre Woods. Oh, geez. That was before my recruiting coverage time, but I remember Pierre Woods very well, yeah. Yeah, I was just, I was just messaging with Pierre this week, so I'm going to ask him. I'm going to say, man, how, what? Remind me of that story. Where was Ohio State in your recruitment? But I'm pretty sure that Pierre was the last guy. I was going to say, he was ranked pretty highly, too. I mean, it, it, it have to think that Ohio State was at least interested in him. But uh, but either way, it, it is a school where it, it feels like when Ohio State puts their foot down, uh, they're very difficult to beat. So, you know, I think if you're a Michigan fan, I think you're ecstatic if you get one of the two guys uh, as I said, I think Aaron Scott is would be the the preferred prospect, but both are very, very, very good. Uh, you know, so yeah, we'll have to see. But yeah, Michigan absolutely has Ohio, Ohio State's kind of taken been able to take the state for granted for a really long time because they they dominated the rivalry for so long. You know, we we talked before about how many guys did they they could just come in at the last minute and offer, you know, and 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 take. Uh, a verbal from you know guy the guys that maybe liked Michigan or like Michigan State or liked Notre Dame uh you know and, and now you know Michigan's at one school right now that can go in and, and pitch and uh make a difference and and, and it looks like that it has uh you know and, and Ohio's strong in 2024 and there's a, some really good prospects in 2025 too uh in, in Ohio that Michigan is already making a run at as well so yeah different a little bit different than it has been for the last 10 or so years or even longer uh, for Michigan and Ohio. Outside of that one stretch with Hoke, the new car smell with Brady Hoke when they got all those kids in the 12 and 13 class. But, uh, you know, otherwise it's it's mostly been Buckeyes. Yeah. Uh, as Mo said to me, not necessarily in that interview, but he said, hey, the boys are back in town. The boys, talking about Michigan, are back in town. You know what? These boys, us, we'll be back next week back in town doing a another episode maybe another commitment episode depends on what the rhythm of the of the recordings looks like but listen you can find all the coverage of the maize and blue all the the most accurate in-depth coverage that you can find anywhere over on the michiganinsider.com one dollar gets you in your first month just one buck a couple pennies a day right get you in Get you access to all of football, basketball, and recruiting intel on the Maize and Blue you want. Get you access to the entire 24-7 Sports Network. So if you want to go read what the Ohio State folks are saying, what Bill Curlick is saying about uh, Aaron Scott's recruitment, you can do that by subscribing to the MichiganInsider.com. Be sure to get on over there and do that. Of course, if you like this podcast, be sure to rate it, review it, tell all your friends about it. If you're listening to us, they can find it wherever they get their podcasts, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes. You name it. Of course, if you're watching us on YouTube, like the channel, subscribe or like the video, subscribe to the channel. You'll keep us growing that way. We'll be back next time on the next edition of the Michigan Recruiting Insider.